One evening, I was sitting at our table looking over my daughter Katie's medical forms. Katie was getting ready to start kindergarten, so the paediatrician gave her a full physical, while my wife left her school forms laying out on the table. I glanced at it lazily and saw the letter that ended my marriage. In the column blood type, it was written. I froze for about ten seconds a minute. I have no idea. I then went to the cabinet and pulled out two sheets of paper from our medical records. Everything was exactly as I remembered. Last summer, my wife and I donated blood to the Red Cross, which gave each of us a receipt indicating our blood type. Here it is on two sheets of paper. Mine is B, hers is O. So there was no way Katie could be my daughter if my wife was her mother, and I saw Marie give birth to her. Then, someone with a type I had to be the father. The children were already asleep. Marie was upstairs watching TV. I took a beer out of the refrigerator and sat in the backyard, thinking. How did my marriage go? I'd say, OK, pretty typical, both good and bad. Depends on what day you asked. When we were dating and in the early months of our marriage, Marie and I were passionately in love. We made love all the time, sometimes madly, and even outside of bed, we constantly touched each other, holding hands, walking hand in hand, stroking each other's neck or back as we passed by. Of course, after some time, it faded away. Doesn't that happen in every marriage? But Nan, with proof of her infidelity hitting me right between the eyes, everything I had ever thought about our marriage was on the rocks. I sat and thought. What changed, gradually or suddenly? It seemed like both. The slowdown in our sex life was gradual for a while, but about six years ago, a few months before Katie was conceived, there were a few strange months. Marie, my open and loving wife, was acting very strange. One evening, she returned from work quite late, briefly allowed me to kiss her tenderly, immediately went to the shower and avoided me for the rest of the evening. The next morning was just as cold and unceremonious. But that night, she became completely different. She came home early, cooked a special dinner, put me to bed early, and lovingly had sex with me, with an eagerness and passion that I thought we had lost. We hunt happily before going to bed, and Marie told me how much she loved me several more times. This week, we had passionate sex. Then, the cold night soon happened again. She returned late from work, didn't say a word to me, and quickly took a shower. For the next two months, I hardly knew who I married. Mary was passionate and loving. Marie was cold. Murray was attentive. Murray was distant and preoccupied. Murray was patient. Murray was obnoxious and hot-tempered. I asked her several times if anything had happened, and if something between us was bothering her, if there were problems at work. But the only response I received was, I don't know, Bill. I'm probably just a little nervous. Sorry. When things finally got back to normal after three months or so, it was much less pleasant than at the beginning of our marriage. Mary became less moody, but she was almost never sweet and loving anymore, and her interest in sex seemed to disappear. We made love no more than once a week, sometimes no more than once every two weeks, and only when I asked quite firmly. Any gentle requests, such as, perhaps we could fool around tonight, was met with sharp refusal. I had to seriously point out how long it had been since we did this. Marie would then have sex with me, but in a way that would make it clear that she was just doing me a favour. Do all marriages follow such a sad pattern? It was the only marriage I knew well, so I couldn't tell. Of course, I wondered what was going on, and my thoughts included the possibility of an affair. But soon after, Marie became pregnant, and our shared excitement about the future baby and the joy of having our wonderful Katie crowded out most of my worries about our marriage. After Katie was born, Marie and I were constantly tired, so her lack of interest in sex was easier to understand, although I still wasn't happy about it. 
And when Katie turned three, Marie became pregnant again, and we had Brian just after Katie's fourth birthday. So, Bill and Marie, lovers and spouses, became Bill and Marie, parents of two wonderful, exhausting children. We both adored our children, and although I now realised that I was deeply unhappy with the state of our marriage and our virtual lack of sex life, I didn't realise it at the time. And if so, then I just decided that all couples with small children go through this. Now, armed with the shocking knowledge that my daughter was not mine, the events of six years ago did not seem so mysterious. Marie must have started an affair around then. This explained the cold and the sudden rush to the shower. The passionate sex and warm affection in the days that followed could be chalked up to guilt or even, if I was being merciful, to a determination to keep her marriage happy by continuing the affair. As I sat in the yard, watching the darkness fall and the stars grow brighter, my inner shock gave way to growing anger. My loving wife not only cuckolded me, but also gave me someone else's child to raise. And maybe not just one, maybe Brian wasn't mine either. If at that moment I was only thinking about punishing Marie, I would have burst into the house, shown her. Blood-type evidence forced her to confess and thrown the lying out onto the street. But it was difficult. I adored my children, whether they were biologically mine or not. If we divorce, Mary will most likely get sole custody once it turns out they're not mine. I sat and thought. I asked it the question, what do I want? And the answers were surprisingly clear. First, I want to know exactly what Marie did. Was it a short novel? Doesn't she even know that Katie isn't my child? Or does she know everything and has been sleeping with some guy behind my back for many years? And secondly, I want to raise my children as my own and never let them know that I am not their father. Once I knew what my goals were, planning how to get there seemed surprisingly easy. I returned to the house and found cotton swabs. Entering each of the children's rooms, I carefully took a swab from the inside of each of their cheeks without waking them and wrapped each one separately. I gave Katie a two and Brian a three. Then I went down to the kitchen, put a tampon on his cheek, and marked it with one. I had a friend who worked in a chemistry lab at a university, and I arranged for him to test the DNA for me. This was the first step, the beginning of collecting information. When I received my first response, I knew what I would do next. A week later, my friend called me. He didn't know whose samples they were. I told him that I had met people with the same last name and we were trying to figure out if we were distant relatives. Hi, Bill, he said. Your two and three are definitely relatives. They are brothers and sisters. But your one is not related to any of them. I guess these people aren't your cousins after all. I thanked him and Hamelp. So, Katie and Brian were brother and sister, meaning they had the same parents. Marie had two children with this mysterious idiot, but did she know about this? Obviously, she knew she was sleeping with this guy, but did she know he was the father of our children? There was an easy way to find out. I went to the kitchen where Marie was washing the dishes. Honey, I want to ask you something. I began without turning around. She told me to go ahead and I continued. A work colleague of mine has a biologist friend who is doing some DNA research, and he needs samples from people who are related. I told him that I would take swabs from you, from me, and from each of the children. Now I'll take care of each of the children before bed, and then you and I will take care of ours later, okay? I watched Marie very carefully as I told my story. Halfway through, she tensed up and almost dropped the pan she was washing. Then she came to her senses and continued to wash. When I finished speaking, there was silence for a minute, and then she turned around and looked at me. I'm not sure I like this idea, Bill. How do we know what this biologist is going to do with the samples, or whether our information will be kept confidential? I started to disagree with her, but she literally flew at me. 
Though I'm just not enthusiastic about this idea, please tell your colleague that we do not want to participate, okay, honey? I said softly. In any case, it's okay. Her reaction told me everything I needed to know. My next step was to find out everything I could about her affair or love affairs. Who, where and when. Maybe even why. I wasn't sure, but it was entirely possible that Marie had something hidden somewhere in her house that would give me a clue. But I needed time to search everything thoroughly. That said, we were planning to go to her parents' house to spend the afternoon there. A few minutes before we were supposed to leave, I went into the bedroom, called our home on my cell phone, then picked up the phone and pretended to be talking to my boss at work. Having finished, I approached Marie. Honey, I'm very sorry. There is a crisis at work, and today they absolutely need me, at least for four hours. Otherwise, the company will have serious problems. Damn it, Bill. My parents are looking forward to meeting their grandchildren. I know, I said soothingly. I'm really sorry. You go just apologize. You and the kids will have a good time. I'll make my staff some dinner, and I'll see you in the evening. She accepted this change in plans without further objection and was soon sitting in the car with the children. Now I had several hours to systematically search the house. I decided that there was little point in looking in the places where I usually go since Marie was unlikely to hide anything there. So I skipped the kitchen, looked shelves in the living room. And I also ignored my bedroom and bathroom parts, but thoroughly checked all of her closet parts and dresser drawers. All that surprised me was a pair of very sexy pieces of lingerie that I had never seen her wear. They were hidden far away in the back corner under everyday things, so she didn't want me to know about them. Only the children's rooms and the attic remained. Deciding that children's rooms were less likely, I climbed into the attic. There were various old and long-forgotten pieces of furniture, a couple of lamps, and several boxes of books and things that predated our wedding. It was too much to check, so I took a closer look. First, I noticed that one of the three boxes to the side looked less dusty than the others. Looking at them more closely, I saw that they had been lifted and moved more recently than the rest of the attic junk, which apparently had not been touched for years. So I devoted my attention to these three boxes and found everything I was looking for. These were all Marie's old things, mostly letters from friends and acquaintances from her college days. Also, I found a bunch of letters and souvenirs from myself, sweet greeting cards and things like that. Quite far down at the bottom of one of the boxes, apparently designed to be hidden by old papers, lay a thin stack of more recent notes and two videotapes. I pulled them out. The cassettes had no labels. The notes were from Harry, and they were brief but overtly erotic. I took the tapes downstairs to take a closer look. Twenty minutes with a stack of notes told me almost everything I needed to know. Marie cheated on me with Harry, her boss at the office where she worked. The affair began, it seemed to me, about three months before Katie was conceived, just at the time when Marie was behaving so strangely and erratically at home. All the notes were from Harry to Marie, and they were rough and strong. There was no love in them, but there was a lot of lust. From the beginning, the relationship seemed almost dominant-submissive, with Harry bossing her around. Some notes told her how to dress for a certain occasion. In others, he described exactly how they would have sex the next time they worked late. A couple of notes congratulated her on the birth of their children and scornfully called me a poor fool who, without knowing it, was raising them for him. It was clear that he did not intend to report his children. I knew that he was happily married to a sweet woman named Caroline, and they had three children of their own. Apparently, Caroline was as unaware of his affair as I was. My jaw clenched as I read. It was clear that Harry was dominating Marie, but she agreed to it voluntarily. There was no hint of rape or blackmail. She seemed to enjoy playing this role for him and being told what to do. 
who the father of Marie's two children was, and it seemed that both of them enjoyed the secret knowledge they had over me. From these notes, I could not learn anything about Marie, but now there was no longer any doubt that she had been fooling me for more than six years and deliberately giving birth to children from another man, pretending to be my loving wife. I had been full of anger for days, but these notes brought it to a boil. My plans for revenge on Marie would also include Harry. I thought for a moment, then took the tapes to the VCR and began to watch. Both were taped showing Harry and Marie having sex. The earlier one, judging by Marie's haircut, was taken in a room I didn't recognise, possibly Harry's house. The more recent one was made in my own bedroom. I wonder when Marie had this opportunity, and it occurred to me that I had several business trips over the past year, and perhaps she was leaving the children with her parents. Overall, the tone of the recordings confirmed Harry's sexual dominance over Marie and her passionate willingness to submit. The lighting wasn't that bright, although they were both clearly visible, but the sound was amazingly good, and I could hear every word, every moan. On the first tape, from the very beginning of their affair, I heard Harry giving commands. First, he sat on the bed and ordered Marie to give him a sexy striptease, which he did with a smile. The sex was rough, not gentle or affectionate, and he spoke roughly to her. I was sad to see that Marie clearly liked what she was getting. The second tape had almost the same sex scenes, but some new interesting dialogue. They were lying on the bed. Marie asked Harry why he didn't mind me raising his children, and he replied, Bill is a nice enough guy, and as you say, he loves children. I have three of them, and I don't care any more than to worry. If it weren't for that, he continued, I would just tell you to leave him. What is he good for besides changing diapers? It's not fair, Harry, Marie said. Bill is a good and sweet person. He truly loved me and was a great provider for me and the children. And that's why you let me have fun with you all these years, right? She smiled at him and lightly hit him on the arm. You've never been as gentle and kind to me as Bill, and that's probably why I like you so much. Yes, baby, I treat you the way you want. Now, let's get on with it before I have to leave. After finishing watching both films, I sat down and thought how arrogant they both are, not only to make these notes, but to be foolish enough to leave them in Harry's notes where I could find them. My revenge will be total, and it will be on both of them. I employed a scanner to digitise each note onto my hard drive. Subsequently, utilising sophisticated software I borrowed from my workplace, used in a project last summer, I transformed each videotape into a digital file on my hard drive, intending to revisit them later for editing. Once finished, I stowed the records and tapes in the trunk of my car, discreetly concealing them beneath the spare tyre. Lastly, I tiddied up the attic, fully arranging everything in its designated spot to ensure Marie remained oblivious to my presence. Over the following two weeks, I methodically devised and executed my plans. Surprisingly, it was much simpler for me to be entirely deceptive toward Marie, behaving as if nothing unusual had occurred. It dawned on me that she had been deceiving me for six years, so why should I struggle to reciprocate? I maintained a facade of sweetness and affection, attending to the children, displaying affection toward Marie as before, and even initiating intimacy a couple of times. However, I approached it cautiously, making it easier for her to decline. In Marie's imminent life milestone, she had been elected as the new president of the Key Society, an influential charity in our city. She was set to officially assume office at a luncheon where she would deliver a speech outlining the charity's plans for the upcoming year. Nervous about her presentation, she requested my assistance in creating the PowerPoint portion she intended to use. This presented a golden opportunity for me. Over a week, we collaborated every evening, with her showcasing her slides and materials for me to organise into a seamless presentation. 
She practiced this routine several times in the month leading up to her significant event, and it consistently went well. Simultaneously, I crafted my own entirely different PowerPoint presentation, ready to substitute hers. On the night before the event, I deleted Marie's file and seamlessly replaced it with mine. I also added a lock so that once the file starts running, she can't disable it. All I had to do was make sure that Marie had invited Harry and his wife to dinner. I casually asked her, yes, she said they would be there on that big night. I was as excited as Marie, although for different reasons. We got there early, and Marie, elegantly dressed in a black evening dress, looked stunning. I helped her set up the laptop and did a couple of tests to make sure it would play. We all enjoyed a good dinner and some opening speeches. Murray was then warmly introduced by the outgoing president, and she walked to the podium, looking shy but proud as everyone applauded. She started talking and launched the PowerPoint file. At first, it behaved as she expected, showing photographs of the society's key charitable projects and then pie charts of income and expenses. Then, as I had planned, it suddenly changed the subject. First, there was a series of still photographs, frames I selected from two videos of a couple having sex in different positions. Some of the photographs were a little dark, but the general impression of ten or twelve of them confirmed that they were Marie and Harry. Marie continued to talk about key social matters for a few minutes, then, noticing the sudden murmur of the audience, she turned around and looked at the screen behind her. She gasped and, with a sharp movement of her hand, knocked over a glass of water onto the podium. For a moment, she stood motionless in complete shock. Then a bright red blush quickly covered her entire face and neck, and she began frantically pressing buttons on her laptop. By then, still photographs had given way to short video clips. How are you going to stop Bill from finding out that I knocked you up? As long as I let him have sex from time to time, he won't suspect anything, Harry said. But not too much, baby. You belong to me. There was noise in the room. Laughter and hooting could be heard from all the tables. Marie stood there in complete shock and disbelief, too stunned at this point to even be embarrassed. At the next table, Caroline, Harry's wife, took a vase of flowers, smashed it over Harry's head, and left the room amidst laughter and shouting. People gradually filed out of the ballroom, looking back at Marie, gesturing to each other as they reenacted the amazing scene. Surprisingly soon, Marie and I were left alone, she stood defeated and lost on the podium. I sat at the table ten feet away from her, smiling widely and looking up at her. Finally, she raised her eyes and looked at me with an expression of terrible sadness. Bill, how could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. Under the circumstances, I found her question funny. I burst out laughing and walked out the door, still laughing. No, no, of course not. It wasn't like that at all. It was a good fantasy, but it couldn't happen. The whole town will know that Harry is the father of my children, and I will lose them in the divorce. And besides, they will hate to be known as Marie's bastards. No, I should have been more subtle, and I did it first. I visited a divorce attorney I knew several times and worked with him to prepare some documents for when I needed them. I then created the exact PowerPoint file I had just described, but I didn't wait until Marie's dinner night to reproduce it. Instead, I set it up and cooked it for Marie one night four weeks before dinner. In the evening, when the children went to bed, I called Marie. Honey, I want you to come and look at the draft of the PowerPoint file I made for your speech next month. Can't wait, Bill, she asked angrily. Today, I'm dead tired. No, honey, I said firmly. I need to see what changes are required so that I have time to make them. Please remember that I do all this for you in my free time. This brought her into the office where I sat her down in front of the computer. Just press the letter when you're ready, and the file will run on its own, I said, smiling to myself. I watched her carefully. 
Everything went well at first, and she practised her remarks on the first few key slides of the society. Then she gasped, and her face paled as she saw still images of her and Harry having sex. She turned to me, mouth wide open, but didn't make a sound. I just looked at her expression and came video clips of them talking about how he was the father of her children and kept me in the dark and more sex scenes. By this time, Marie was desperately trying to stop the file, but I blocked it. Then, the screen went dark. All this took about two minutes. Marie sat limp in the chair, head down. She couldn't bring herself to look at me. I quietly enjoyed every moment of her suffering. She finally spoke, raising her head to look at me. In five minutes, I age twenty years, Bill. I don't. Oh, Bill, I'm so sorry, she started crying. I'm really sorry. Can you ever forgive me? Forgive you? I asked coldly. For what? Well, let's see. Because you had an affair with Harry Dorner, which seems to have been going on for the last six years that we've been married, for bearing him two children and letting me think they were mine, for laughing at me and speaking contemptuously about me behind my back, for refusing me sex at Harry's insistence. Do you want me to forgive you for this? Now she was sobbing even more. Bill, I don't love him. You are the person I love, the person I have always loved. My anger was cold, restrained. I didn't say anything, but I thought, no, Marie, this is not love. You love our life together. You like how I do everything for you, how I take care of the children, but you don't love me. No woman can love her husband and behave behind his back the way you do. I sat back and let her cry. I was very pleased to see this, and I did not say a word during the twenty minutes it took her to cry. Finally, she sobbed several times, wiped her face with her hands, and looked at me. What are you going to do, Bill? Are you going to divorce me? No, Marie, I won't do that, I lied. I care too much about Katie and Brian, even if they are other people's children. I let the words hang in the air for a moment, then continued, but here... Everything will be completely different. You can be sure. Let's start right now. Call that Harry and tell him to be here in fifteen minutes. She looked at me in horror. But I can't do this. He's at home with his wife and children. He will not come. I smiled. Say whatever you need, but call him here. You can tell him from me that if he does not appear here in fifteen minutes, then tomorrow his marriage will be dissolved. She looked at me, perhaps afraid of the coldness on my face. Then, without saying another word, she went to the kitchen and called her lover. When Harry appeared, he gave me the soft, insincere smile I was expecting. Marie must have told him what had happened, and he looked worried. Come into the office and sit down, Harry, and you too, Marie. We need to talk about something. As soon as we took our seats, I began, OK. Harry, here's the situation. You've been enjoying yourself with Marie for quite some time, making a fool out of me. It's done now. Everything has changed, and it's time for you to face the consequences. He attempted to respond, but I interrupted him. Sit, watch, and listen. Navigating through the PowerPoint file, I relished seeing the horror on his face. As it unfolded, when the presentation concluded, an unexpected prolonged silence filled the room. Personally, I think I enjoyed it more than they did. Now, you will do exactly as I say, or your blissful marriage to Caroline will come to an abrupt and public end. Understood. Don't utter a word, just nod your head, I commanded. He nodded reluctantly, a visible anger in his expression. Good. Listen to me and keep that mouth shut. I have several documents for you to sign. I'll present them to you one by one. You might want your lawyer to review them. I'm giving you 48 hours to return the signed documents to me. Otherwise, Caroline will be invited to a brief video presentation. 
The first document acknowledges that you are the biological father of Katie and Brian, and you agree to provide child support for them until they turn 21, along with a lump sum for college. The amounts are specified here, $10,000 per child per year plus $100,000 per child in the first year of college. The funds will be placed in a trust of which I am the sole trustee, authorised to use it for the needs of the two children. Harry jumped from his chair in anger, protesting, Listen, Bill, this is complete absurdity. I have no intentions. I firmly pushed him back into his seat. Shut up, Harry. You have money, and we both know it very well. This is not your show anymore. It's mine, and you have no choice. Now shut up until I tell you that you can talk. I saw Marie looking at me from across the room with some kind of horror on her face. This was a sight of her loving husband that she had never seen before. The second document gives me your permission to adopt the two children. You and Marie will have to sign it. I will ask her to do this after you return it to me. This is the third statement in which you forever renounce your parental rights to Katie and Brian and swear never to disclose to anyone that you are their biological father. And lastly, this is a personal admission that you sexually harassed my wife in the workplace, forcing her to have an affair with you. Harry jumped up again. This is a complete lie. She wanted it as much as I did. Sit down, Harry, I said gloomily. Maybe so, but Marie will still sign a sexual harassment complaint against you. This is one of my conditions not to divorce her. Is that clear, Marie? I asked, turning to her. Marie looked from me to Harry with a frightened look. She didn't answer. Let me explain, I told them both. I'm not going to do anything with any of these documents, but this is my insurance, Harry, in case you ever think about abandoning your financial obligations to your two children. Or in case it suddenly occurs to you that you wish someone else knew who their biological father is. I handed Marie the sexual harassment complaint my lawyer had written. Sign it, Marie, I said firmly. Still looking scared, she silently took the pen from my hand and signed the complaint at the bottom. Now, Harry, we are almost done with your part of today's meeting. I expect these signed documents to be back in my hands within 48 hours. You can bring them here to the house. And if you ever get some dark, crazy idea like killing me, I assure you that several copies of your incriminating notes and love notes to Marie are in a safe place and several people have been instructed to make sure they would come to light if anything happened to me. Have questions. I concluded, looking at him contemptuously. I led her back into the office and sat her down. I had never seen her like this before. She was trembling with horror. It's okay, Marie. I will never hit you. You don't need to be afraid. God, Bill, what's gotten into you? How could you do this to Harry? She asked, looking at me with some surprise. You really don't understand, Marie. Don't you understand that what he did to you, what he did to me, is wicked and wrong? She blushed. Yes, of course, it's simple. Well, you're so angry. It's like you've gone crazy. I had nothing to answer, so I was silent for a minute. Marie, I told you I won't divorce you, but our marriage sure as hell won't last the same way. From now on, everything will be completely different. Do you understand me? Of course, Bill. I will do anything to make up for what I have. What did I do to you? She looked at me pleadingly. Okay. I said, let's establish a couple of conditions moving forward. Firstly, you must secure a new job within the next two weeks. I will no longer tolerate you interacting with Harry on a daily basis at work. It should go without saying, but there will be no personal contact with Harry from now on. No touching, no kissing, no sex, no phone calls, no emails, absolutely nothing. Furthermore, if our marriage is to continue, it must be based on an entirely different foundation. I won't endure your bad moods, coldness, and indifference any longer. 
I expect you to be a joyful, kind and affectionate wife. Your actions each day should reflect your love for me and your gratitude for being married to me. And all that passion and sensuality you unleashed with Harry, I expect you to direct it towards me now. I eagerly anticipate seeing you in the sexy lingerie you've never worn before, the one tucked away in the back of your drawer. I stared at her meaningfully, and she lowered her eyes in shame. Moreover, I expect you to be ready, willing, and eager whenever I desire intimacy. If you truly love me, Marie, you have a lot of lost time to make up for. She walked across the room, knelt at my feet, wrapping her arms tightly around my legs and looked at me. I love you, Bill, more than words can express, and I'll demonstrate how dedicated I am. As I observed her pale face stained with tears and her fearful eyes, I realized that somewhere inside me, remnants of the love and devotion I felt for this woman still lingered. However, they were overshadowed and diminished by my anger at her self-centeredness and hypocrisy. She deserved everything she was going to get. I pretended to soften a little. Listen, Marie, I said more softly, in four weeks your big social dinner will take place. Let's use these weeks to start over, to make something new, maybe even better, out of our marriage. If all goes well, then dinner will be our chance to celebrate the success of our new endeavour. What do you say? She nodded at me, tightening her grip on my legs. Yes, Bill, thank you. Thanks for giving me a chance, and I will be what you want me to be. I pulled her towards me, and she cried and kissed my lips and face again and again. Now, give me ten minutes to clean myself up a little, and then I'll start making amends, she said, standing up and smiling as she left the room. I sat back in my chair, grinning to myself, watching Marie twist herself into a pretzel trying to please me. For the next four weeks it's going to be a lot of fun, I thought. I was a little surprised that she didn't notice what I didn't do. I didn't ask her anything about the affair, how it started, etc. The whole evening must have been such a shock for her that she didn't have time to think about it. But of course, I didn't ask because I simply didn't care. I was done with Marie. She just didn't know it yet. When I entered the bedroom a few minutes later, the bed had been made, the lights were dimmed, and Marie was lying on her side in an incredibly revealing red nightgown. She washed her face, combed her hair, and fixed her makeup. She looked amazing, as beautiful as ever. She also looked very nervous, and I noticed that there was a bottle of lube on the nightstand. Where are you? She said in a sexy voice, but with a slight tremble. Come to me. She extended her arms towards me, and I quickly took off my clothes and hugged her. We started kissing, her body was hot, and she wriggled like a snake. Whether it was pure play, I enjoyed it. I found myself quite capable of putting aside the rage and disgust I felt towards Marie and immersing myself in pleasure with her. She had a beautiful body, and her impatience was exciting, especially after so many years of indifference. I rolled onto my back and let her take the lead, which she seemed happy to do. When she was done, she turned off the light and snuggled up to me under the blanket. She gently kissed my neck and said, sleep well. As I fell into a contented sleep, I looked forward to receiving the same attention over the next four weeks. I really enjoyed the following weeks as Marie put all her energy into rebuilding our marriage. The next morning, she woke me up with a cheerful smile and a loving kiss, asking if I would like some below-the-belt pleasure before scrambled eggs and bacon. I enjoyed breakfast, watching with interest as Marie did more than her usual job of preparing the children for their day. That evening, I came home to eat an unusual meal that Marie had found a recipe for in a cookbook and decided to try to cook. Katie and Brian, who demanded hot dogs and macaroni and cheese, didn't like it, but I did. Anne-Marie took the initiative to make sure the kids bathed and went to bed on time so the two of us could enjoy our evening. Our nightly romp in the bedroom was a pleasant change from the previous night. 
Modi had another sexy nightgown, and we enjoyed leisurely sex. Her enthusiasm, affection, and energy were exactly the same. Despite my secret feelings, I couldn't help but notice that we acted like two happy newlyweds. Day after day, Marie's loving attention did not wane. She was cheerful and helpful in the mornings, and with the children and tigress in the bedroom. There are some sexy new lingerie items out there, and they're getting full approval. Several new positions were explored, and some of them were great in every way. My life became like a happy fantasy, except of course that I no longer trusted my wife one iota, that beneath my happy submission to her attentions, I was filled with rage, and that I was only pretending to share her loving feelings. The papers Harry signed were in my mailbox within 48 hours as I requested. I quickly got Marie to sign the adoption consent and took it to my lawyer. That same week, he arranged a private hearing before a judge and ten. Days later, the legal adoption was finalised. Then my lawyer took care of the divorce papers. One morning at work, I received a surprise visit from Denise Reynolds, a colleague with whom I share projects from time to time. At 28, she was five years younger than me and a real knockout. I knew she was divorced, and from time to time, her remarks to me as I walked through the office seemed a little flirtatious, but I never thought much about her other than that. She was almost at the top of my list of women I'd sleep with in your fantasy. I expected Denise's visit to be work-related, but it wasn't. Bill, she said, what has changed in you lately? What have you been doing? You seem... I don't know, younger or in better shape or something. Thank you for the compliment, Denise, I said with a smile. Then thinking, what the hell? I rushed on, actually something completely different, but I can't talk about it here. Maybe we can have lunch together today. Sounds great, she replied. We went to the salad bar, then took our lunches to a table in the park and enjoyed the sun while we ate. The difference in me that you noticed is probably that my marriage is in terrible shape, I explained. She looked puzzled. And that makes you look better. Explain, please. I gave her a carefully edited version of the story. A couple of weeks ago, I found out that my wife was cheating on me with a guy from work. This has been going on for a very long time. I gave him some gentle lessons to get him to leave her alone, and since then... She has been doing everything she can to make it up to me. I'll tell you a secret, Denise. Millie thinks she can get me back, but I've already decided that in a few weeks I won't be with her. I can't live with a woman who betrayed me like that. In the meantime, she treats me like a king, both in and out of the bedroom. That's the difference you noticed today. She looked at me appraisingly. I'm impressed that you're doing so well. When I found out my ex was cheating on me, I almost fell apart. It took several months before I regained my peace of mind. I'm very sorry, I said. I didn't know you went through this. But at the moment, I have taken control of my situation. It will develop the way I want, not someone else. This makes me feel much better. Saying, what the hell to myself again? I added, one of the nice things about my situation is that even though I'm not officially single yet, I know I will be soon. So I don't have to restrain myself from expressing my admiration for the very nice lady sitting with me in the park today. And I looked at her, smiling. She blushed slightly and looked away, then looked back at me. Lord, Bill, you managed to put me in an awkward position. I didn't think it was so simple, she said. Sorry, Denise, but you are so beautiful and so funny. I've been attracted to you since we met. It's just that until now, it was forbidden to talk about it. Any chance you'll have dinner with me on Saturday? I know a nice little Italian place overlooking the river. She looked at me very seriously. Bill, I like you too, and it was always easy with you. Can I trust you? Is your marriage really over, or is this just some ploy to get into my pants? Forgive me, but I've seen this scene before, Denise. I have always been frank with you, and as you know, I have never pestered you before. 
I'm breaking up with Marie in about two weeks and will be filing for divorce that same day. There is no turning back, but I understand if you want to push me away. I'll just be a little disappointed, she smiled. No, Bill. Now that you've made me an offer, I'm ready to accept it before you change your mind. She looked at me intently, and I hesitated a little, leaned forward, and we kissed lightly and tenderly. It wasn't a hot, sexy kiss, but it felt like a wonderful promise. When I told my wife I had a date on Saturday night, it certainly brought out the bastard in me. I made it clear that I would be going out with another woman, and that I expected her to stay home with the kids. Bill, Marie was shocked and seemed ready to cry. But I tried so hard to think of something to save our marriage. How can you see someone else? It's very simple, Marie. Not only did you see someone else, but you also had sex with him behind my back for six years. You've been amazing lately, and I'm feeling a lot better, but that doesn't mean you deserve my complete devotion. It seems pretty obvious that I'm going to have to have fun with someone else for quite some time before we're even. She started to cry a little. Will you sleep with her? No, but I can, and this is exactly what you have to come to terms with. If this makes you feel terrible, well, this will help you understand how you made me feel. And with that, I ended the conversation by leaving the room. My first dates with Denise were delightful but cautious. We took our time. Both of us probably felt that we were experiencing something more than just sexual attraction to each other. We chatted and laughed, complained about our co-workers, told stories about growing up, and just got to know each other. It was convenient and easy. It even sometimes reminded me of my first days with Marie. The thoughts saddened me, but I pushed them away. After our third dinner, as I opened Denise's car door outside her apartment, she quietly asked, Do you want to come in? We both knew what it meant, and I was instantly horny. When we walked in sight, she was immediately in my arms, and we were kissing and hugging like two teenagers. She pulled away from me a little and said seriously, I really want this, Bill, but I'm very nervous. It's been a long time. Please be gentle with me and take your time. Of course, I said with a smile, gently picking her up. Which way is your bedroom? Sex with Denise was amazing but completely different from what I had with Marie. At first, she was a little shy, quite passive, allowing me to stroke and caress her breasts and body. But she was so gorgeous that I enjoyed every part of her. Our first sex was relaxed, soft, gentle. It was infinitely more loving than the sporty sex I had with Marie. It was actually like two people who care about each other making each other happy. When we finished, Denise kissed me several times and asked if I could stay the night. I happily agreed, and we fell asleep in each other's arms. The next morning, she was a little embarrassed again, and we did not make love, but said goodbye with sincere tenderness and kissed tenderly several times. There were only a few days left until my big wedding night with Marie. I did not reveal my plans to Denise, but I told her that I would be officially divorced very soon and would be on my way to getting a divorce. When I walked through the door around 9.30 that morning, Marie was quietly crying at the kitchen table. It was obvious how I had spent the previous night, pretending to sympathise with her more than I felt. I hugged her tenderly. I'm sorry, Marie. I know how you feel, believe me. God, Bill, this is just terrible. The very thought of you in another woman's bed tears me apart. I've been so selfish all these years. How could I not think about you and how my actions would make you feel? She looked at me and said, thank you. Thank you for giving me another chance. Marie's great night, like mine, was quickly approaching. To some extent, I almost regretted it. The last four weeks with Marie, including very qualitative sex, were a lot of fun, and I will miss them. But nothing she did even began to cool my resentment and anger. Her complete betrayal went far beyond what she could do to make amends. 
When I looked into my heart, there was only a tiny thimble of love for her and only a tiny drop of sympathy for what was about to happen to her. While working with her on a PowerPoint presentation for her speech, I also secretly prepared my own version, not exactly the one she saw, as I needed to hide Harry's identity and the fact that he was the children's father, but the general approach was the same. First, a series of photographs and then some wonderful videos. I set up the laptop so that Marie's presentation would play every time she used it, but by pressing a key combination, including A, of course, I could lock her presentation and replace it with my own special file. Both in the days leading up to the dinner and that evening, Marie fearfully asked me if I had deleted that horrible file that had played for her four weeks ago. Each time, with a loving smile, I would reassure her that it was gone, and I would go to the laptop and show her that her presentation was there and would play with the click of a button. The last few days at home had been especially sweet. Murray was beginning to feel more confident that she was winning me over again, and her loving attention seemed calmer and somehow less desperate. At the same time, the pain she felt when I spent the whole night with Denise made her rise even higher in our bed, knowing that this was all about to end. I enjoyed every moment. When the big night arrived, we were there early, me in a rented tuxedo, Marie looking glamorous in a black evening dress with spaghetti straps that showed off her neck and shoulders. We ran her PowerPoint presentation through twice, so she was confident everything was fine. As she leaned over to place her purse under the podium, I quickly entered the key combination and everything was in place. And everything went exactly as I expected. We had a good dinner, chatting amicably with our friends around the table. There were a few dull greetings. Then, Marie was warmly introduced by the outgoing president, and she nervously walked to the podium to the sound of general applause. According to my watch, her excitement and happiness lasted exactly 54 seconds. That's how much time passed between the start of the PowerPoint file and the moment her audience started seeing still photos of her cheating. Marie did not freeze or knock over the glass of water, but she turned and stared at me with horror and disbelief in her eyes before desperately trying to stop the file from playing. Of course she failed. When the video clip started and the sound filled the room, she just stood there, slouched, beep red, looking at the floor and she did not make the slightest movement when the surprise of the audience gave way to indignation mixed with laughter and did not react in any way to obscene cries sent to her by someone from the retreating crowd. A few minutes later, we were alone. I sat quietly, looking at her from my place at the table. Finally, she spoke. A question from my fantasy, Bill. How could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. Yes, Marie. I answered her. Over the past few weeks, I have loved you just as much as you loved me six years before. I walked up to the podium and placed several folded sheets of paper in her hand. I'm divorcing you. Consider yourself served. If you stay in town, you'll get joint custody of Katie and Brian. Otherwise, I'll fight you for full custody and you know I'll win. Having almost reached the door, I heard her scream in anger and pain. But you said you wouldn't divorce me. You said we could try to figure it out. I turned around and looked at her. Yes, Marie, I said. So I guess after all these years of you lying to me, I lied to myself. For an eye. And so subscribe to our channel so that your second half doesn't cheat on you. And go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Second story, I cheated with a co-worker. So I'll start this off by saying I already know I'm in the wrong 100% of the time. About a year ago, our management team welcomed a new member. We first met at a company meeting, and I made a conscious effort to help her feel comfortable joining our team, considering the rest of us had been here for years. At the time... I was 27, as was she. During our initial meeting, she was dressed in business casual attire, and I didn't think much of it. 
being reserved, which is typical when starting a new job, she and I hit it off immediately. While our team's communication was generally good, I noticed a change in the attitudes of the two other women, which is expected when a new person joins. However, I didn't notice any change in myself, assuming it was due to our shared age and common interests. She had an alternative style, with random hair colours, and identified as a witch girl. In short, I would complete my work quickly and then spend the remaining time in her office, or vice versa. Both of us being married, we often discussed our spouses openly while acknowledging our mutual attraction. We made it clear that we were committed to our marriages and wouldn't do anything to jeopardise them. This routine continued for about nine months until I received a call in the middle of the night. Her husband had cheated on her. It was a turning point in our relationship, and I found myself in a supportive role, helping her navigate through this difficult time. My life was going pretty great. I had no complaints at this point. So, our company was hiring within for some positions, and she got one. I was pretty bummed because I looked at her as a friend. She leaves and goes to her new position, and I go back to doing the usual job duty tasks. Two weeks go by, and she has to come back to her office for some reason and asks if I can meet her. We drive around while completing job duties. The entire time, she has changed completely on her stance of cheating and is throwing herself at me. We don't do anything, but it's obvious of the tension between us. We texted for an entire week about it, then we end up hanging out for a while and nothing happens again. We talk about it, but nothing happens. She then explains that she was having an episode and we shouldn't be doing this. I agree and let it go. Two weeks go by of texts and light flirting. During a day when it was only me in the building, she comes up and goes in for the kill shot. She basically undermines her husband in every way and is once again throwing herself at me. We do some touching, but nothing happens that is actual sex. She goes home and talks to her husband, then tells me once again she was having an episode. At this point, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have feelings for her. She then calls me and explains to me that she can't stop herself when she's around me, so we need to cut off communication entirely. I accept this, but I am hurt, even though I know I sound awful because I am married. We haven't talked since then. She told me before we cut off communication that she was thinking about me non-stop, which is the same thing I was doing. My only question is, should I expect her to come round again? I know I shouldn't be hurt, but I somewhat am. Third story. This is honestly embarrassing. TLDR. Block the father of my child along with his family for having an entirely separate relationship and causing immeasurable amounts of stress and drama. So, maybe I should start at the beginning. I met this guy, thought we were in love, whatever. We started dating, and eventually, I got pregnant. My son is nearly a year old now. The guy had a disturbingly persistent ex-girlfriend who would harass him, his family, me, and even my own family for over a year. He'd give me vague answers, claiming there's nothing more he can do, and show me proof of him telling her off. I should have left after he allowed her to kick me in the stomach while I was pregnant, after she persistently claimed they were together during her visits to my house, and after his family invited her over, divulging all our personal information. I should have realised he wasn't a good boyfriend or father, despite the red flags. I was stuck on the good times we shared. He was making an effort to be better for our son and me, and things seemed positive. However... Randomly, he stopped communicating, went MIA for a week, and then I received a message from the ex-girlfriend. In her message, she claimed she was pregnant and apologised for her past actions. She expressed a desire to be cordial because our kids might be siblings. However, this was the same person who had wished death upon my son and caused immense stress for well over a year. She continued to say that my boyfriend and she were together, 
arguing that it wasn't fair for him to be there for their unborn child and not mine. She revealed how he allegedly explained to her that the only reason he stayed with me for so long was because he wanted to see his son. It frustrated me how she knew he had been lying to both of us, but still spoke to me as if the things he said were true, expecting me to co-parent with them. I tried being nice to her. I tried to be calm. I told her I am done because, with already knowing a bit about her, she didn't text me to be nice. She just wanted to make sure I was out of the situation so she can be with him. Mind you, he treats her much worse. She had to tell me all about it. I don't mind. Please take him away. But I explained to her how I've heard enough and I don't need every personal detail of everything. That went on for two days. She would send me her ultrasound pictures, possible baby names, etc., etc. All I could think about is how I didn't ask, and why would I be supporting some weirdo that did all these disgusting things to me not too long ago? I don't think an apology can fix the stress caused and still being caused. She was just being extremely ignorant and expecting me to be her best friend all because she wanted information. She continued to give me extremely personal information between them, which I tried not to do to her because that's gross and it's our business, even if he was a liar. Anyway, I find myself going on and on. I decided to block her and made it clear that I no longer cared about her, him or their child. I expressed my preference to completely remove myself from the situation. Furthermore, I blocked his family. At this point, I don't care if my son is related to them. I've realized I don't need anyone's assistance. His father hasn't done a single thing for our child, and his family has been deceitful, more concerned about the next child. It's been two months since anyone has inquired about my son. I genuinely feel there's no compelling reason to stay in contact, and I doubt his father cares enough to fight for visitation. It was never about our child, it was always about maintaining control over me and our situation. I've come to this conclusion based on his reactions when I declared I'm done. His responses usually involve phrases like, good luck with all that, or find someone else to be his dad, even when I don't bring up a new man. I merely called him out for treating us poorly. The fact that even after discovering the truth, he continued to feed me lies and act as if he did nothing wrong, insisting that I'm all he wants is truly disgusting. But I don't know if how I'm acting is okay. Other people would be about maturity and do the co-parenting, but this situation is all drama-causing, and I don't feel the need to be a part of it or drag my son through it either. I've done nothing but try to raise my son in peace, and yet I've been harassed and hit, and also brought my own family into it somehow. It's all much too weird for me. I'd much rather keep everyone blocked and forget it. Am I wrong? Also, this is my first post. I probably didn't follow the guidelines and also, for that, I'm sorry. I also really tried to sum this up, but it's all super fresh in my mind and I feel like the full background helps. I'm also terrible at explaining things. Thanks for joining.